Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Alliance of Neighborhood Associations, I'm pleased to welcome you to our Meet the Candidates event. My name is Ben Moylan. I'm the current chairman of the Alliance, or NA, the ANA as we refer to it, and I will be your moderator for tonight's events. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our generous hosts, Buchart Horn, for providing this wonderful venue. I'd also like to thank AARP for getting the word out through their email blast to their membership and for providing some of the refreshments for tonight. I'd also be remiss if I did not thank the Special Event Committee of the ANA for helping to pull all of this together. A lot of people did a lot of work for several months and I appreciate it. For those of you who may not be familiar with the ANA, let me provide a quick overview. Founded in 2001, the York Alliance of Neighborhood Associations is a voluntary organization comprised of members representing York's 17 individual neighborhood associations. The focus of the ANA is to encourage resident participation in neighborhood activities, provide a forum for neighborhood associations to share information and best practices, support neighborhood safety, beautification, and code enforcement efforts, and represent the interests of York's residential neighborhoods by providing consensus input to city government. The ANA meets on the third Monday of each month at Martin Memorial Library. We encourage additional neighborhood participation. And for more information, please visit our website at www.anayork.webs.com. On May 21st of this month, Pennsylvania will hold primary elections across the Commonwealth to select candidates for the general election on November 5th. In the 95th Legislative District, there will also be a special election to fill the seat vacated by Eugene De Pasquale when he became Auditor General. This will give an opportunity for even registered independents, such as myself, a reason to go to the polls on May 21st. Allow me to outline for you the format of the evening. We have with us all of the candidates who will be on the ballot for the primary election for York City Mayor and York City Council. We also have the candidates who will be on the ballot for the special election. For the first 90 minutes, I will be asking the candidates questions prepared with input from the ANA membership. The candidates have received these questions prior to the event in order to prepare responses that will fit within the allotted time frame. We will not be fielding questions from the audience. However, there will be ample opportunity to mingle with the candidates and to engage in one-on-one -on -one discussion in the tiled portion of this venue during the last 30 minutes of the event. So without further delay, let me introduce the candidates. They will not have opening remarks. Instead, the last question for each candidate is open-ended and allows them to rebut, to recap, to address what they'd like you to know that may not be related to the questions that were asked. For the race for the 95th district representative seat, Kevin Schreiber is our Democratic candidate. Bill Swartz is the Green Party candidate. Brian Tate is the Republican candidate. For the mayor of York, Kim Bracey is the Democratic candidate, and Carol Hill Evans is also the Democratic candidate for the primary election. For York City Council, there are two four-year seats and one two-year seat that will be open. Cindy Martin is the Republican candidate for the four-year seat. Renee Nelson, Democratic candidate for the four-year seat. Henry Nixon, Democratic candidate for the four-year seat. And David Satterley, Democratic candidate for the two-year seat. With that, let's move into the question and answer period. Thank you. I'm going to first pose the questions to the 95th District 
representative candidates. And we're going, we've decided we're going to go in um, ascending alpha, last name alphabetical order to start and then we'll rotate the questions as we go through for, to try to maintain some degree of fairness. Uh, candidates feel free to remain seated or stand if you wish, it doesn't matter to me, but you can stay at your position as we go through this. We will finish up one race, then go to the next, and then go to the next after that. The timer, as you see, is over there on the side. It will be green for most of the time frame, and you know your questions each have different amounts of time. It will turn yellow for the last 30 seconds and red for the last 15 seconds, and then an alarm will go off. <laughs> I know you will want to keep talking when the alarm goes off, but if you could finish up your thought, I don't want, you need not stop in the middle of a sentence, but if you could finish up your thought, that would be great. So without further ado now, first question. One of the biggest challenges facing York's neighborhoods is the growing tax burden facing property owners. Our seniors are spending more of their fixed incomes on taxes. Current residents are reevaluating whether to remain in the city. And potential buyers are discouraged not only by the current tax rates, but the uncertainty of future increases. City officials have stated that York and other third-class cities have limited options without comprehensive reform of revenue generation and distribution policies within the Commonwealth. If elected, what specific actions do you plan to take to champion such reform? Mr. Schreiber. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, and thank you all for coming out this evening and in sharing a little bit of time with us here at Bucard Horn. Uh, I appreciate this question because I believe I am one of those city officials that has been championing reform uh, as long as I've been economic development director. I have testified before the Pennsylvania Senate, I have testified before the Pennsylvania House, I have testified before the Urban Land Institute, all of which on uh, reform of our third class cities. And you guys know the statistics, 37% tax exempt, highest concentrations of poverty, of blight, our city is landlocked and developed to its core. We have a, a surrounding tax base of wealth and we have a, a, we have a city that is very challenged from the inside. It should not surprise us that York City is in the current financial dire straits that it's in. The cards are stacked against our city and one only look around at Harrisburg, at Reading, at Altoona, at Scranton, and a whole host of other cities we are all in this together and York is not alone. So we do need comprehensive reform. We need to reduce our dependence on property tax and we need a new menu of revenue options that will help offset and drive down property tax. And there is no question, it is unequivocal, that reductions in state education funding have led to increased property taxes for local school districts. There are statewide proposals currently to increase sales tax, to increase income tax, or other unique proposals such as Philadelphia and Pittsburgh that have a consumption tax, which is essentially a per drink tax on alcoholic beverages. So if I'm buying a beer in Philadelphia, I'm paying a nickel on every dollar. If I'm getting a $5 beer, I'm paying a quarter. Now that quarter is going right back to the city of Philadelphia to pay for cops and fire. Those are the first responders that are generally called out to deal with alcohol-related incidents. Now that consumption tax makes common sense to me. And why Philadelphia and Pittsburgh have it and everywhere else does not just baffles me. And that's a progressive tax, meaning it grows as the market grows. So if the economy is doing well, the revenue is good, that will, that will increase. Conversely, property tax here in the cities in particular is a regressive tax. It holds down the market, it stymies investment, and generally speaking, it disproportionately negatively impacts seniors and those on fixed income. And as we know in York City, it depresses property value. These are user-based systems. They are fair to seniors. They're fair to our middle class. And they make common sense. Now, it makes sense to me that every day in Harrisburg, I will be fighting for these types of reforms and for other reforms such as this, such as Right now, we are giving away our environmental natural resource and we could be taxing it, the drilling, to use that revenue 
to offset property tax. Thank you. Let me just make sure we're set up here. Sorry for that interruption. Same question to Mr. Swartz. My name is Bill Swartz. I want to thank everyone for coming this evening. Um, and my answer to that question is as follows. I think, first of all, that we have been talking about tax reform for a long, long time. Depending on who you speak to, it's been 20, 30, 40 years that people have been sitting at tables like this talking about tax reform. And I think what we all want is tax reform to be enacted. Um, if you watch TV, you would think that 50% uh, of the people think one thing and 50% of the people think another. And what I'm finding as I go to doors in West York, uh, in the city of York, in North York Borough, and Spring Garden Township, is that about 80% of the people agree on the major issues. Um, and what I believe is that this election is about leadership. And part of leadership is harnessing that consensus that exists already that will help bring the political will for tax reform in Harrisburg. I've spent a lot of time in Harrisburg in the last several months, and I think the time is ripe for reform. I'm hearing from legislators and their staff, both senior and low-level staff, that the pressure from citizens is getting so great and I've actually heard this phrase, that we can no longer do nothing. Now what I would do um, is work with other legislators and citizen, citizens groups to bring enough pressure to the legislature to cut property taxes in half in York County. We need enabling legis legislation that will allow us to, do, to determine our own, our own destiny. I would uh, help cut property taxes in half I would make up the difference with a countywide flat income tax. And I would distribute that revenue based on the number of students in the district. I would also encourage uh, the county and municipalities to do zero-based budgeting. I would push for a new proposal that would uh, require that assessment values could no more than double over a period of 29 years that would incentivize a lot of new investment in our community, that would help attract and retain residents and businesses, which would in turn grow our tax base and increase property values. I think it's also high time we take a look at tax exempt properties. Um, for too long, over 30% um, of our potential tax base is tax exempt. And lastly, I think it's important to note that there are many large corporations, including Hershey Foods and many others, that take their income in Delaware. And I think we need to close the Delaware loophole. If we did that, Pennsylvania's tax rate, their business tax rate, would be one of the lowest in the nation. And we could attract and retain businesses that way. So <clears throat> I feel very strongly that, you know, we're gonna talk about reforming schools, we're gonna talk about crime, um, I think it's very important that we realize that there are no easy solutions. We need to grow our tax base um, and we need to increase property values. Thank you very much. Same question for Mr. Tate. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Brian Tate and I want to serve as your state representative here in the 95th district. I say that because I'm one of you. For the past 24 years, I've lived here in the city of York alongside of you, and I've worked with my neighbors in the downtown East and Old Town East neighborhoods. I'm not sure men, how many of you are aware of it, but there was a recent survey done in one of our neighborhoods here in the city. And in that survey, there were some startling statistics uh, from the respondents. 57%, more than 57% of the people in that particular neighborhood said they would probably not be living here in the city in the next, within the next five years. The reason 
The number one reason, 72% said, was taxes. This is the most important issue in this race. I've heard it not just here in the city of York going door to door. I've heard it in Spring Garden Township, in West York Borough, in North York Borough, and in West Manchester Township. It is the number one thing that people are talking about in this race. I served 12 years as, state rep as uh, Chief of Staff to Congressman Todd Platts, both when he was in the State House of Representatives and in Congress. During those years, I worked as part of a team and the other legislators around York County have been looking at this issue and have been wanting to work toward local tax reform for quite some time. The unfortunate part is our state house is currently controlled by Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and their suburbs. Those legislators don't necessarily want to create those changes. What we need to do is start building our own team. We need to have a representative here in the 95th district who has built relationships with those elected officials and become a part of a team that will go to Harrisburg and build relationships with the other neighboring teams, Adams County's legislative delegation, Cumberland County, Dauphin County, Lancaster County, all of them around us, and start building a bigger team. And working together, we can accomplish that tax reform goal. I have two specific things that I would like to focus on. The first, regarding tax reform, is I think we do need to offer a cafeteria plan for our school districts and for our municipalities throughout uh, Pennsylvania so that our regions can determine what's the best thing to raise revenues to provide for core services where they are. Northern Pennsylvania is very different from where we live. In Northern Pennsylvania, they don't have the population that we have, so they might need to use a property tax to raise the revenue to provide their services. However, here, property tax is regressive. It's driving people out of our city. It's the worst way to raise taxes. We need to change that and provide the right options so that our city can collect taxes in the right way to provide our services. Additionally, we need to change the funding formulas for education. Currently, the funding formulas are not using current data for the amount of students we have. Growing districts like those in York County are losing out to districts in the suburbs of Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. And as your newest state representative, I will work hard to make those changes happen. Thank you. Thank you all. Moving on to the next question, and Mr. Swartz will be the first one to respond to this. Providing a quality education for our children always ranks as a top priority for city residents. However, like other urban centers, York has both a challenged funding base and a larger percentage of higher cost special needs students when compared to surrounding districts. Higher taxes have not yielded higher test scores and property owners are facing millage rates that are among the highest in Pennsylvania. A number of, pos of possible remedies have been explored recently for York, including charter and cyber schools, district consolidation, voucher programs, and funding reform. In your opinion, what should the Commonwealth be doing to address the funding, regulation, and performance issues surrounding our school systems? And what will you do as an advocate for such change? First of all, many of you are aware that Pennsylvania has over 2,500 municipalities, 2,500 little governments. And in York County, that translates to 72 municipalities. We also have 16 school districts. Now, to a lot of us, that sounds kind of absurd. It might have made sense when we were in horses and wagons, but right now you can go the whole way across York County in, in an hour or less in many cases. Um, I was very surprised though, when David Rusk came to our community a few uh, weeks ago and said to me directly, forget about consolidation. And many of us thought that that was David Rusk's solution. Uh, for any of you that don't know, he came here about 17 years ago and proposed solutions for York. Came back again seven years later and uh, sort of gave us a report card on how we were doing on implementing those solutions. <clears throat> he gave us an F, by the way. And he came back again, I think it was uh, two or three years ago and again a few weeks ago. What David Rusk's real prescription was for York County was that we need to incentivize mixed income housing all around our county to break the concentration of poverty. Now the reason I mention this is that there are no easy answers to the education problem. 
of course we need whatever short-term solutions uh, we can muster because there are real kids on the ground now in the schools. I'm there every Tuesday morning uh, for an hour or two. I've met many of these students and they are, they are so bright and so hungry to learn. Um, and I've met many great teachers as well. Um, however, what we, we find is that our community thinks that we can have a short-term solution to this. The, shor the short-term solution, of course, is to get our fiscal house in order, and that needs to happen. There have been decades of mismanagement on that front. However, if we think we're going to improve academic performance in, in the short term, I think we're kidding ourselves. We need to get real, and we need to follow David Rusk's prescription. Um, I believe that and support the internal reform plan for the school district. I think it was very unfair of the governor to cut $1 billion for edu from education. Um, I believe we should invest in the education of young people um, now rather than wasting money on prisons to lock our children up when they grow older. Um, so I think it's time for us to get real. We need to pur pursue short-term solutions, but please look very carefully at the data on my website, swartzforyork.com, and you'll see that David Rusk shows that charter schools fare no better. So let's not get distracted by this shiny object. We might think that that's the panacea, but the Rusk's data shows very clearly, not just in York, but in Philadelphia as well, across the board, that charter schools are not the panacea we once thought. Thank you. Same question for Mr. Tate. Thank you. For the past 10 years, I've been working as Vice President for Philanthropy at York County Community Foundation. And through my role at the Community Foundation, I have uh, been able to participate in this conversation about uh, providing a quality education for all of our children in York County. And we've been specifically looking at quality education in the city of York. I think there are two specific ways that we can provide quality education. Those two specific ways are providing a stellar learning environment while including those children, those educators, and their families in the process, and also having a diverse population of students learning together, which will break the concentration of poverty here in our community. I think that there are two ways that we can do that to address these issues. First, in my role at the Community Foundation, I was the person who helped to investigate the movement that was being, dis uh, dis um, being discussed regarding the International Baccalaureate program. The Community Foundation, uh, through its work with York Counts, studied the International Baccalaureate program and through that study recommended to its board to give the first grant of $75,000 that would help a group of citizens to create the York Academy Regional Charter School. The York Academy Regional Charter School is a wonderful educational opportunity here in York. It is a nonprofit community charter school. It's providing education without sending dollars to a for-profit company to manage the school. Through that uh, conversation with people like Dr. Dennis Bachman, a proud York City graduate, Sue Krebs, another proud William Penn graduate, we all worked together to create this wonderful model for what our schools could look like. This is also a model that creates a partnership among different school districts. There are three chartering districts working together. That tells us that we can work toward a day when school districts collaborate and maybe even come together to provide quality education for all children. But in this particular situation, we are also deconcentrating poverty because we have 50% of those students coming from the city of York and 50% of those students coming from the outlying areas in York County. We have children of all types learning and playing and working together every day. So I think that's one step. The other step is to get behind and support the all charter proposal that is in front of the York City School District right now. And I say that because I'm not talking about a for-profit model, I'm talking about a nonprofit community charter model where we would emulate what's been created at the York Academy Regional Charter School and do the exact same type of thing here for the rest of our schools in York and provide a quality learning environment that brings all types of students together so that they can learn and succeed in our community and be great citizens here in York. Thank you. 
And now to Mr. Schreiber. Thank you all. I'm going to stand up so I can see everyone because I want to be able to see everyone in the back. Uh, well, if that's it, then I'll just sit right down. Uh, look, it's unequivocal that property taxes and education funding are inextricably linked. And the governor's budget, where he cut su substantially education funding, without a doubt led to increased property taxes by local school districts. Whether it was Spring Garden, West York, North York, York City, West Manchester, all of those residents are concerned about the unpredictability of their property taxes for their local school districts. The Pennsylvania Constitution states that it is the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania's responsibility to provide a thorough system of education for all. That's system, not systems. So that means if you're in Lower Marion Township near Philadelphia, Jacobus, or York City, your educational experience should be exactly the same across the board and equitable. Right now, we have a system where we're setting up two different kinds of education. And I would be very hesitant to turn our district over to a 100% charter district for very substantial reasons. One, never tested before in the country, never tested before in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We have no guarantee that this will be successful. And once it's done, it may be very difficult to unravel the knot. You walk along Rathdon Road right now, you've got one side of the street with $150,000 homes paying 8,000 in taxes, sending their kid to York City. The other side of the street, $300,000 home paying 4,000 in taxes, sending to York Suburban. I am very concerned if we go down this road of 100% charter, we're setting up Brown versus Board of Education all over again. We're separate and unequal. And that's, <laughs> look, Pennsylvania was first in public libraries. We were first in public universities. Public education is in our blood. It's a Pennsylvanian trait. If we shirk this responsibility, we're mortgaging our future. And right now, if all that we get out of 100% charter school is to pay the same taxes, but pay our teachers a little bit less, then I don't know when in America we decided that paying less got you better quality. And I think that's something that we need to be very concerned with going forward, because right now we're paying King of Prussia rates for discount store education. And as I said, this is something very serious. We have 8,000 kids in this district, and at the end of the day, one only need look at the Auditor General's recent report that there are some good charters, there are some not so good. And in some cases, the money is not getting to the kids. Thank you. The next question will start with Mr. Tate. State and federal funding programs like Weed and Seed addressing the quality of life in high crime areas, and Elm Street addressing the revitalization of our urban neighborhoods have been instrumental in helping York to bridge the gap between revenue generation and spending in recent years. Do you support such programs? And if so, what are your plans to help York City to secure similar funding in the future? If not, what alternatives would you suggest to address some of York's urban challenges? Thank you. Before I answer that question, I wanna follow up on a couple points. First of all, we're currently paying the most for our education right now, and it's not succeeding. I think we need to think about that when we talk about the proposals that are in front of the city school district right now. We also need to remember that charter schools are public schools. They're approved by our public school board and they are operated within the guidelines presented by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Additionally, we need to remember that these are not untested proposals that are being brought forward to York City. They're being tested quite well in Pittsburgh, in Philadelphia, in Baltimore, and particularly in New Orleans, a place that's been devastated not only by its education system, but also by Hurricane Katrina. And after an all-charter model was brought forward in New Orleans for those remaining uh, children in New Orleans, five years later, they are having great success with an all-charter model. So I think we need to take a look at the success that is being proven throughout the country, and we need to take a look at um, at proposals like the Propel schools and the KIPP schools. And those are the types of nonprofit public charters that we're talking about. 
not a for-profit type of business. So we need to consider what's actually being proposed. But on the topic in front of us right now, um, programs like Weed and Seed and Elm Street that are providing dollars to, to uh, third-class cities and other communities across the Commonwealth. I definitely have participated in, in those types of programs during my, uh, during my employment with Congressman Platts, both in the State House and in Congress, and working with the communities here in York County and the 19th Congressional District to, to receive those dollars that were being provided by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And I would certainly continue to work in that direction. I will tell you, however, that I think our economic development strategy here in Pennsylvania is upside down. We charge businesses in Pennsylvania some of the highest business taxes in the country. Think about that. When businesses want to grow in York County and in Pennsylvania, they have to think about, are we gonna to continue to pay these high taxes? Or are we gonna continue, are we gonna think about looking elsewhere and moving somewhere else? And that's what's happening all the time here in this community and in other places throughout Pennsylvania. Similarly, when businesses look at coming to Pennsylvania, that's the first thing they look at. And they check off a box, no, that they don't want to pay those high business taxes. We need to change that system. We need to lower business taxes so that businesses want to do business here, so they want to grow their businesses here, and so that they're providing good paying jobs for the people here in this community, and then they use their own resources to help us as a community to solve the problems that we have in this community. It's time to stop, spend, to stop sending all of our businesses' dollars to Harrisburg so that Harrisburg can hold them hostage and dole them out to other places. We need to keep York's dollars here in York. Thank you. We charge some pretty high corporate tax rates because most of our companies are headquartered in Delaware. Um, and right now, as we speak, we are giving away our natural resource in, in the Marcella Shale. And let me just say, what is more important? That drilling companies are making billions and, and millions of dollars in revenue, or that our kids have books, and that they have a sound educational opportunity? Now, I appreciate this question on Weed and Seed and, and Elm Street, because I am the only candidate that has worked intimately with each of these programs and put them to good use in our neighborhoods. These were effective programs that put cops on the street, added more walking patrols, tore down blighted properties, uh, trained volunteers, increased our street lighting, built new infrastructure, built new parks. These were successful programs. The common, uh, uh, Old Town East in York City was the Commonwealth's first Elm Street community. And I submitted the Commonwealth's very last Elm Street application on behalf of the Salem Square neighborhood. And when the Elm Street program was essentially defunded and eliminated, what we did was we cobbled together our resources, we pulled together as a team, and we reinforced the partnerships that we had and continued to move forward and make progress in our West End. When we lost weed and seed funding, when we lost the Elm Street funding, we looked at our community development block grant funding that the city receives as a federal entitlement. We eliminated much of the granting we were doing to nonprofits to recreate and cobbled together $250,000 so we could recreate the Elm Street program. And that's why we have new sidewalks and street lights on Penn Street. That's why we have them on West Princess. That's why we have them on South Pine Street. Now these are highly competitive programs and let's face it, DCED is about 40% of what it was three years ago. It has been defunded by over 60% and it is a shadow of what it once was. We have a $24 million project in the city in the Think Loud project that I've been working with and trying to get some love from our state government. So we need a representative in Harrisburg that understands the challenges that our communities are facing, understands how to work in the street, on the street, with the faith-based community, with the churches, with the education community, with residents and with volunteers to get things done. That's what I've done for the city, not looking through a lens of party or ideology, but looking at it through the lens of how to get things done. In our Royal Square neighborhood, when our Community Foundation decided the project was not quite ready for funding, I went out and raised $415,000. We've now taken that $400,000 and worked with the YWCA. We're submitting an application for $1.25 million. We're going to take that $1.5 million and we're going to be successful. We're going to invest it on Duke Street, on Queen Street, on Princess and King because it's important. And when the Kodo Development Group needed a million dollars to get the project successful, 
we creatively accepted a grant from the state that we loaned to the developer. That developer will pay interest and pay that loan back to the city that it can then reloan into the community. Now that's the gift that keeps on giving. Thank you, Mr. Schwartz. I think it's very true that we need to continue to pursue whatever resources we can from the state and federal government. However, once again, I think it's high time we start to accept some hard truths. And that is that state and federal funding is beginning to dwindle. And if any of us think it's going to start coming back anytime soon, I think we're kidding ourselves. So what do we do? How do we get real? Of course, I would work hard to build relationship, relationships with other legislators and members of the community to get whatever resources we could for our community. I think all three of us would do that. But I also have experience at helping to grow our community from the ground up. I worked very hard with the Board of Central Market, and I was the person, along with others, who walked through the market with Senator Casey and presented him with a plan that eventually raised $2 million for the restoration of Central Market. I worked with my partners to develop two projects in York, uh, Codo 241 and Codo 28, and that is building our community from the ground up. We need to get real. State and federal funding is not necessarily going to be there forever. Uh, we need to fight for those dollars, but what we really need to do is increase property values by incentivizing small businesses, which create 85% of all jobs. Now you might say, how do we increase property values by incentivizing small businesses? Well, if we grow jobs in our community, we can attract and retain residents. The same is true for passing a law that would require businesses in our community, like Hershey Foods, to pay their taxes and not hide their revenue in Wilmington. Why would Hershey paying their taxes make a difference for your property values? Because all of a sudden, our community is not, no longer starving for resources. And our small businesses would be paying one of the lowest tax rates, lowest corporate tax rates in the nation. That attracts and retains residents. It's very important that we implement new and innovative programs. And that's why I believe that we should institute a law that says that property values, or I'm sorry, assessment values can no more than double for a period of 29 years. Now you might say, well, why is that important? Well, it's important to a young woman who might invest in a house on South Street that she purchases for $20,000. She might put $80,000 into that house but under this program, her assessment value would go no higher than $40,000. We need to attract and retain residents and businesses to our community. We cannot rely just on federal and state funding. Of course we would fight for that, but we need to think to the future. And we'll, we'll start with Mr. Schreiber on this question. This is the final question for the 95th district candidates for the evening. And you will hear a similar question for each candidate as we continue on through the evening. Candidates, the voters will have a choice on May 21st. Why you and why now? And thank you again all, and thank you to my, my colleagues and opponents here. We all are friends, while we may not play it on TV, um, and we all do believe in this community and put community first and, and put service over self, and I do think it's commendable to this whole table, uh, to individuals that are put, willing to put themselves out there. Um, I, I came to York for York College, and where I got my bachelor's degree, and I'm, I'm fortunate now to also have a master's degree in public administration. And I fell in love with York and decided to stay. I moved into the city, I got involved, and really haven't looked back since. I fell in love with a York native, my wife Jen, uh, who is here tonight and is now a small business owner in our city, owning the Green Bean Roasting Company. And we live in Newton Square, where it's uh, Jen, myself, and our dog, and we love our, our life here in York. 
I've been fortunate to work for the city of York for over seven years, and that has been a great experience uh, to work alongside every one of you and, and folks at this table to really work for the common good, to see good things happen in our city. And that's what it's all about. During my tenure, I have been fortunate to see over oversee over $125 million in economic and community development. And that is a stark number for a community our size. And I know Bill helped out with the central market funding. It was about $4 million, and I remember presenting to Governor Rendell and Senator Casey how we break that up for farmer's market, for central market, for market view, and the commercial kitchen. So we've been very successful, but what this job has done is take me face to face on a daily basis with the real and pressing challenges that our small communities face in Pennsylvania. My job on a daily basis is to improve the quality of life for our community and to improve the investor confidence for small businesses and organizations to thrive and for residents that want to live here and, and play here and raise a family here. And we've had some good success, but what has tipped the scale for me and made me want to run is the simple fact that Harrisburg is holding us back. Harrisburg is holding back our small communities throughout Pennsylvania from reaching and meeting their full potential. And one only need walk around downtown to see that there are challenges, but there is also a heck of a lot of opportunity. I have worked hard for the city. I have fought hard for these 43,000 residents of our city for projects, programs, and policies that make sense and that meet the common good. I'll work hard for this district, for the 65,000 residents of this district, and that's why I ask for your vote on May 21st to be your next state representative. Thank you all. Okay, Mr. Swartz. Many of you know that I'm a lifelong York resident. Uh, many of you do not know that my first job when I graduated from Colgate University was working as a garbage man. I've picked up a lot of uh, the garbage in our community, maybe, maybe for some of you. Um, I've worked very hard to grow my business. I started it about 15 years ago. And the problems that we're talking about here tonight are not theoretical to me. I live with my wife, Kelly, in Spring Garden Township. We've watched our taxes rise and we've watched services decline, both with education and otherwise. I started a small business, as I said, 15 years ago in York City and have watched taxes increase dramatically. Um, I've also experienced how crime affects our community. But I realize also that we need to grow our community from the ground up. That's why six years ago, I gathered with partners and we put our names on the dotted line and took a risk for our community. We saw a demand. And I'm here to give you some good news. You know, we built two apartment complexes. Both of those are full and they have a waiting list. And there's demand for seven to 800 new units like them. That doesn't mean we're gonna grow our community just with high-end apartments, but it does show there's demand for our community, especially at the heart of our community. People wanna live in the heart of our county, where they can walk to Central Market and the stadium and nightlife and restaurants. We have this huge opportunity. There is a national trend towards return to cities. What I lament is at the same time we have this wind at our backs, we have definitely not put up our sales. If you look at what has happened with business tax rates, if you look at what has happened with property tax rates, if you look at how we've allowed our education system to decline, you'll admit that we have not put up our sales. And that's not just political leaders. If we're gonna turn this thing around, and this is a dramatic situation, we can't fiddle around the edges. If we're gonna turn this thing around, it's gonna take more than bold leadership. It's gonna take bold citizenship. And as your state legislator, I will work hard to harness the consensus that already exists. I've been to many of your doors. I know you agree. And I will work hard with other legislators to build real reform, not just talk about tax reform. You all don't need to come to any more of these meetings and see any more people at a table tell you it's necessary. You know it's necessary. What you need is somebody that can get things done. 
If you elect me as your state representative, I will work tirelessly for this community. Just as I work tires, tirelessly for Central Market, for Kodo, for my business, and as a caseworker at Bell Family Shelter. Thank you. Mr. Tate. Thank you very much. And thank you to the ANA for sponsoring this debate tonight. I'd also like to say thank you for helping me celebrate my 46th birthday. Um, it's, it's unusual to be in an event like this for your birthday, but I appreciate the celebration and we can all have some refreshments together afterward. I'd like to tell you a little bit more about myself. I'm a native York Countyan. I was born in Memorial Hospital. I grew up out towards Spring Grove and graduated from Spring Grove High School. And after graduation, I went to Temple University where I received a bachelor's degree in broadcast journalism. My first job opportunity brought me back to York. I thought that was outstanding because I loved my community where I grew up. But what was even better is when I started that job for Susquehanna Faults Graph, actually working for cable TV of York with the local channel Cable 4, the first thing I realized was I loved the city. I learned when I was in Philadelphia that I loved the urban environment. So the first thing I did was start looking for a house in the city of York. I found my home on South Pine Street and I lived there for 20 years. And while I lived there, I got active in my community. I became involved with Downtown East, then I participated with those same neighbors to create Old Town East. And I'll tell you, when we were working to create Old Town East, we went to the Community Foundation for the very first grant that got the Old Town East neighborhood started. I learned very quickly through my role here in the community that it takes a lot of partnerships to make things happen. It takes people working together on the street, it takes people who know how to work within the systems. It takes people who want to actually partner together regardless of their political parties and make things happen for a community. I'd also like to tell you a little bit about my volunteerism. I think in this campaign, I'm trying to promote the, the three important things about me, my experience, my community leadership, and the trust that I've grown throughout this community. I've done that through my volunteerism at my church, St. Matthew Lutheran Church on the west end of town, through my active role at Rotary Club of York, through my neighborhood associations, through my volunteerism on the York City Recreation and Parks Board from 1994 to 2007, when that board was, was uh, taken apart because we had other beautification opportunities happening in the city of York when we were helping build that million dollar endowment at the Community Foundation that now provides resources every year to beautify our city. In addition, I served in civic opportunities in this community. I served on the transition team for our county commissioners when there was a change in the guard. I served on Mayor Bracey's transition team in 2009. I do all of these things because I'm an active participant in the development and promotion of York. My experience is that for 12 years, I served as Chief of Staff for Congressman Todd Platts. In that role, I was his key liaison with constituents, with legislation, with the White House, and with our legislative delegation. I have built a level of trust with that group of people, and I would like to join that group to advance York and York County in Harrisburg. Thank you very much. Thank you three. Now you can take a, a break for a little while. And the next question is going to be a five minute question if you'll change the clock while I read the question. We're going to move on to the two candidates who are seeking the uh, Democratic uh, nomination on uh, the 21st for uh, the, the uh, mayor of York City. This is a lengthy question. It's in two parts, but it made sense to put it together and um, bear with me as I, I read it. Candidates, you'll have you know the full five minutes to answer both halves of the question. We're not going to break up each half. So one of the major challenges for the city's chief executive is to balance a finite revenue stream with competing demands for available funds. Tough choices 
often on both sides of the scale, need to be made to achieve that balance? As a two-part question, let's look at both sides. Several options exist to increase revenue, such as tax rate increases, higher fees and fines, higher collection rates for delinquent taxes and fees, payments in lieu of taxes for exempt properties, and economic development projects to expand and increase the value of the tax base. Please outline how you would plan to use any or all of these options during the upcoming term. On the other side, given the spending demands from fire and police services, to parks and recreation, to maintenance of roads and infrastructure, to litter and snow removal, and a whole host of other things, what are your priorities? What must be maintained, and what are you willing to sacrifice? And we'll start with Ms. Bracey. Thank you, Ben. Good evening, everyone. It's good to see so many people out, fellow Yorkers out this evening. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Bucard and Horn, for hosting us as well, too. I remember when the ANA used to regularly meet here up in the offices there, so thank you. Um, I've sort of combined these questions, Ben. Raising taxes is, is always the last thing on the agenda, and only when that is, and that's only done when it's absolutely necessary. Economic development is great. We all love it. We know it happens. Um, and we've accomplished quite a bit over the last several years, but we cannot develop our way out of our fisc uh, into a fiscal stability. It just doesn't happen. Revenue doesn't come just by raising more money. By, uh, redu we have to do it by reducing expenses as well, by doing things smarter and working more efficiently of what we have already done. Did you know, uh, since I've taken office, we have reduced our, our employee complement by uh, lost 32 jobs. That is also, in my opinion, working efficiently and reducing our expenses. And, that, and we found ourselves increasing some of our efficiencies as well, too, doing more with less. I cut $600,000 in overtime. Unpopular for some, but the right thing to do for the taxpayers. I made the long overdue decision to shut off water on delinquent uh, sewer accounts that has led to over one to over one point five million dollars in revenue. And we believe we're on track to continue to see that sort of revenue coming in and it growing. I agree that the decision to go after these uncollected dollars was long overdue, a long overdue decision. And frankly, I'm not sure why the prior mayors, Mayor Aldhouse, Mayor Robertson, Mayor Brenner, um, didn't decide to do it before, but I did. And we realized new money. I've made the personal request to our tax exempt communities, along with uh, Councilman Henry Nixon, asking them to contribute, contribute something to help cover the costs that for everything that they want, public safety, uh, streets and roads repair, lighting, everything we all want. You kind of phrased the question as pilots, payment in lieu of taxes. We call it in helping with public safety and infrastructure. And honestly, folks, um, Henry's been the only one on council that has helped me make those ask. And I think every elected official should be able to do that. They should be more concerned about helping the city in that way, helping to grow these additional revenues and work alongside of us, as opposed to sometimes working against these issues. We're on track to collect that same type of revenue this upcoming year, and that is another area that we're pretty proud of seeing revenue grow. The reality is though, despite all these things, police and fire continue to consume more and more of our general fund. 70%, 70% right now of our general fund goes towards public safety. As that happens, we have less and less money to do other things. There's other things that we all want to have done in the city. But I'm not willing to sacrifice public safety. I've made, the clear, I've made that clear in the past and I'm making it clear again. We've launched six neighborhood enforcement police units and it is a success. We're finding success in it. Crime is going down. And if we aren't safe in all areas, including fire, protection, what is all this about? So public safety to me is paramount and something that I will not sacrifice. 
The way we do government in Pennsylvania is broken and outdated. You heard that from our representative candidates. Our county is only as strong as our city, and we need our county to take more responsibility in our state to help lead the reform that we're all asking for. As mayor, I will continue to make the difficult decisions, which will likely ruffle some feathers, as I have done. Again, I know the sewer refuse decision was not popular, but it was the right thing to do. That collection needed to start. I know cutting overtime was not popular, but $2 million in savings is popular, and it was real and is real money. And that's over two mils in taxes. I'm proud of these accomplishments, and I'm willing to keep fighting for our city. Let's, let's restart the clock. Ms. Hill Evans, thank you. thank you. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you everyone for being here this evening. It's good to see so many of you, many of you whom I've seen um, out in the community, knocked on your doors. Thank you for being here, I appreciate the support. It's my desire not to increase the tax rate, so that would be the absolute last resort. Higher fees and fines become burdensome, especially to those who are conscientious enough to pay a fee or a fine. I have no problem increasing the collection rates for delinquent taxes and fees, but if payments are not being made in the first place, an increase is not gonna guarantee payment. So let's look to the pilot. Yes, we've collected some money, but currently, we're leaving it up to the nonprofit to pay what they want when in fact we should be setting payment amounts. Why not form a task force that includes representatives from various nonprofits, our hospitals, our colleges, our businesses, our local government, our community organizations, and our labor? The task force fairly sets contribution amounts based on such criteria as the size of the organization, the number of people served, the taxes of the value of the land being purchased and the value of improvements for expansion. Nonprofits would know ahead of time what's expected, and we as the city would know ahead of time what we can expect. They can add it to their budget, we can add it to our budget. The task force would be the one that would be setting the requirement to pay. We have to think of new ways to calculate pilot payments. We can use assessed value, we can use square footage, operating income, or it can be based on economic activities such as in the case of hospitals or colleges, however many beds we can do uh, according to that. The bottom line is that the price should be negotiated on a multi-year basis and include built-in increases. What I really think we need is a new way of thinking about how we structure our budget in an attempt to keep our taxes level. So I've looked at some models like zero-based budgeting or budgeting for outcomes, models that work successfully in keeping taxes level with future tax reduction being the goal. And while, yes, we've done a lot of cutting here and there, we can't continue to raise our taxes beyond our current 20.37 millage, which happens to be the highest in the county. So I'll convene a Blue Ribbon Committee comprised of the best minds in county and city government businesses and residents that will offer suggestions to our finance team in helping to figure out the best way to create a lean budget that eliminates unnecessary spending, levels our taxes, and addresses other financial issues facing the city of York. Further, I will work with finance to develop a five-year financial plan so we all know where we need to be and we'll also know what steps we need to take in order to get there. Each year, we will monitor and then we will, assure, we will assure that we are following our plan. And if we have to, we'll make adjustments in order to continue toward our five-year goal. For economic development, we've had some real blessings with businesses that have just shown up. We need to assure that as they continue to look at York, that we're prepared to offer everything we can in the way of continuing support to help them become and remain successful. By nurturing our relationships with banks and lenders, we can offer small businesses uh, loans um, through the Small Business Administration's 504 program. This is a program that helps prepare entrepreneurs 
for real business ventures so that when funding, such as our $15 million new tax credits that was announced just today, when they become available, we're ready. The loans can even enable purchase of buildings such, such as the ones that the RDA currently owns so that they can begin their businesses inside those buildings. My priorities include public safety, particularly reduction in crime. Public safety is not just police, it's fire too. And we have to be careful and very mindful that while we're cutting, that we still have appropriate levels of coverage and staffing to assure that in, indeed public safety needs are met. As I mentioned earlier, by thinking of new ways to do business, we could consider things such as budgeting for outcomes. This is a model that allows public leaders to do um, some big picture creative thinking as we've heard we need to do each time they prepare a budget. Usually we take the previous year's budget and we either add or we subtract and we end up with tax increases that don't guarantee we get the services we really want or need. Budgeting for outcomes is good because it sets the price for government, it develops a purchase plan for each priority, it solicits offers to deliver the desired results. Again, this is just one model of new big picture thinking that's necessary for the city of York and it's going to take capable, dedicated leadership that I will provide to help make short-term sacrifices for long-term gains. Thank you. You'll actually keep the microphone and we're, we're going to alternate. This is now going to be a three-minute question if you'll change the clock back. Can everybody hear? I, I did increase the volume. We good in the very back? Okay, thank you. The ANA has worked collaboratively with the city to foster neighborhood involvement, community support, or, or sorry, support community development and raise the visibility of resident concerns. It played a significant role in representing the neighborhood interests during the comprehensive plan and zoning ordinance revisions, noting upon completion that the key to realizing the vision would be enforcement. During a recent meeting, the Alliance membership agreed that enforcement and responsiveness were areas where they would like to see improvement. As mayor, what will you do to address this during the next four years? During the next four years, York City will become a role model for municipal customer service, where the government works for the people, not the other way around. I will work to create an accessible, responsible and responsive government. City Hall will be the home to efficient, friendly, knowledgeable staff that the community not only needs, but it deserves. I will immediately implement a 48-hour response callback system, similar to one already being used by other municipalities. We will look to one call to City Hall. The concept is to use one line that acts as a repository for non-emergency questions and concerns. It eliminates calling five different numbers and hoping to get a response in a real human voice. Our staff will be cross-trained to handle frequent customers' questions and the most basic questions from our customers. Another step in the direction of becoming the model for customer service. I was recently challenged about not having created much legislation during my time on city council. Our ordinances adequately address what we need to move forward, but legislation is only as good as its enforcement, and enforcement is a function of the administration. The lack of response and unreturned phone calls will be a thing of the past. Enforcement and responsiveness will be an area I will expect to hear from, to hear about from the public when it's not happening. If public comment sessions are continued at council, I or one of my staff will be available to receive comments. We'll take care of the questions and complaints and we'll address them as soon as possible. In addition, I will expect that my administration will be prepared to receive annual report cards. I will set aside time in the community to allow for the public to tell me how we're doing and what we need to do to improve. 
It's government that works for the people. Thank you. Uh, we've um, been doing a lot of that work as well, alongside city council members. Uh, we are proud of the work that's been done, particularly with the AMA as well, too, developing our comprehensive plan as well as the zoning ordinance together. And we will continue to do that. Property maintenance and enforcement, yes, that's, that's an issue um, throughout. First of all, as you all know, in the United States and in Pennsylvania, in Pennsylvania, the Constitution kind of enshrines property rights. This is America. We can't just go kicking in doors and, and making everything right. This is America, which is a great country that we all love, but we know everyone has rights. So when we discuss inspections and enforcement, it is a process involving the executive branch of government, the legislative branch of government, and the judiciary branches of government as well. I agree. I agree, as I've already said, and you are right, enforcement and responsiveness is an area that I, too, would like to see improved upon. But it takes more than just the executive branch of government. When I took office, we began an effort to getting our own house in order, so to speak. We painted our curbs, we striped our streets, we even took 10 minutes on Tuesdays, which we are still doing, and so much more. But we need property owners, property owners of all shapes and sizes, to take responsibility. And frankly, we've drawn a line in the sand and gone after quite a few irresponsible owners, pretty aggressively, too, I might have. We led the rewrite of the zoning ordinance and we have even deputized our property maintenance inspectors to help us to enforce the zoning ordinance. 12,000 inspections were conducted last year, 12,000 by the executive branch of government. We led four clean sweeps, tons of trash removed, citizen inspectors program reintroduced and with a renewed energy. We've condemned hundreds of, uh, of vacant properties and we've closed even nuisance properties. That's what the executive branch of government has done in the last years that I've been in office. Citing, citing owners is a legal process, as I've already said, and it consumes resources. So it's so much more than being able to uh, score our wins. We have four property maintenance inspectors in the city of York, four. Most of you have their cell phones, in fact. I know that for a fact. But enforcement of tenant-occupied properties, which comprise 56% of our city, 56% of our city properties are tenant-occupied, falls under the collective bargaining agreement of our fire department. We need to negotiate with our firefighters to allow our property maintenance inspectors to do this work and do it with you all as well. You know why? Because it's a force multiplier. And our property maintenance inspectors are proactively, proactively inspecting daily throughout the city. And it's their only job. We need firefighters to do their job. We need other people to help their property maintenance inspectors get their jobs done. Thank you. We're going to move on to the last question. All right. And, and again, the voters have a choice when they go to the polls for the primary election on May 21st. So starting with Ms. Bracey, why you and why now? Thank you, Ben, and thank you again to the ANA and our host of the establishment, Bukhar Horn, this evening. It's been an honor and a privilege to serve as mayor of our city for these past uh, three years, and it has gone by very, very fast. I'm reminded of that honor daily as I meet with residents such as yourselves throughout our community and as I work alongside our business leaders to improve our cities or even thank our small businesses for choosing York as their place to invest and open their businesses. Public service is a true honor and not one that I take lightly. It carries with it very difficult decisions and the weight of those decisions on a thousand of lives impacted daily. I do respectfully ask for your support and your vote on May 21st to continue the job we have before us. As I said three years ago at my inauguration, our city wrestles with very serious issues, and many of them would not be solved overnight. But it would take our entire community to pull together and forge ahead 
so that the city could meet its full potential. And we worked hard together over the last three years. I am a realistic optimist, though. I recognize that our city is not without challenges. But we are also without, not without tremendous successes. We are not without good neighbors, good people, opportunity, and a lot of potential. You all deserve someone as mayor that will level with you at all times, that will be candid. In three years, we have made some very, very, very tough decisions to reduce costs and to retain public safety services while at it. Make no mistake about it, no one of these decisions were, were easy or simple, but the, the fact is they were the right decisions to be made. And there will be deci more decisions ahead of us as well. The city needs a mayor that is willing to stick their neck out and make a decision and defend us if need be. The city needs a mayor that is an advocate for all residents. And the city needs a mayor that understands what our city needs in businesses to, th to thrive. We also need a mayor that recognizes some of these issues can only be solved by our state government. I've led a coalition of government and chamber of commerce from the Commonwealth together to advocate for municipal reform. Our business community recognizes that the challenges confronting cities are not of our own creation, but are born of the laws being stacked against us. This mayor, again, is working alongside our business community and chambers from across the state to get this reform done. You have a choice ahead of you, and I hope you will vote for me on May 21st and commit to working with me. We did not get into this situation overnight, but I hope these past three years have demonstrated my resolve to make the difficult decisions required of a mayor and have re represented my understanding of the issues, too, that impact the lives daily, that impact all of our lives daily, and how to face them head on. I appreciate the audience you have given me this evening, and I appreciate your commitment to having the best city that we can have, and I appreciate the opportunity to serve you as York City Mayor. Thank you. I'm well suited to lead the city toward the goals that I've put forth. I'm a lifelong resident of York, and I am in touch with the citizenry and the issues that we face. As a graduate of Penn State with a bachelor's degree in business, I bring academic knowledge as well as administrative and organizational skill sets. The knowledge I've gained over the last five years on City Council has enabled me to better understand the complexities of York City's budget and has equipped me to develop effective processes and policies that govern our city. I will bring civility and professionalism to the office of mayor. My positive, professional attitude will be the expectation for everyone in my administration. We will be a problem-solving team, not distracted by inflammatory public displays and bashing the very organizations that we need as partners. I will use the same skills of negotiation and compromise that I used while working for Caterpillar at the U with the UAW for 27 years and then at Harley-Davidson for eight years. I will be diligent in resolving issues as expeditiously and cost-effectively as possible, working toward win-win solutions. And at the end of the day, my administration and I will serve the public as professionals without personalizing issues. I will welcome open discussion, constructive criticism, and healthy disagreements to reach solutions to the myriad of problems facing our city. Success will depend on my administration, all city employees, and every resident of this city working with city council, our businesses, our faith community, and other nonprofit entities. I believe in the end we all want the same thing, to see our city become its financially vibrant best. And we can get there with the right leadership. I'm the right leadership. Thank you again to the ANA for hosting this vitally important forum and for the opportunity to be heard. York's future is filled with challenges, but I believe we can overcome these challenges and we can move forward together. Please vote Carol Hill Evans for mayor on May 21st. Thank you.
Thank you very much, mayoral candidates. Now we're going to move on to the last race of the evening, which will be York City Council. And we'll be starting with Ms. Martin and working down the table for the first question. The residents of York are concerned with decreasing home values, the high level of property taxation, the quality and cost of education, the enforcement of codes, and the reduction of crime and blight within the city. Clearly, some of these concerns fall more within the control of the school board or the city administration, but the legislative body also has a role in addressing many of them. In your opinion, as leaders, what new initiatives should council members be pursuing to address these concerns? And what should have the highest priority and what do you plan to sponsor personally? You have four minutes. Hi everyone, thank you for being here. Um, I really appreciate you taking your time out of your evening. Um, I feel that, um, uh, excuse me, I think that it would be important for businesses Oh, sorry. <laughs> I think it would be important for businesses to move back into the city because that would contribute to our tax base. You have more people working, more people paying taxes, and that would broaden our ta tax base. Also, I think it would help if maybe we would look at maybe the police now living in the city, and that way we'd have the police there to see the crime, and if any, and they can see the areas that really have some issues instead of living outside the city and also then contributing to um, the taxes and lowering the tax base. Um, I know pensions are uh, an issue too and we need to maybe look at that too because that is a big part of the budget. And, um, that's really it. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Nelson. Hello. Okay, I'm going to start with education because anyone who knows me, I graduate in 17 days with my degree in education. So I'll start off with that. Um, I think a large part of what we mentioned is the amount of poverty we have here. We can't change that at this point. So I think what's important is they mentioned comparing us to Baltimore. I think something important that you need to remember about Baltimore is they are funded for preschool. We are not here in Pennsylvania. So it's not a fair comparison. I just want to throw that out there. So until we have more funds for preschool, because our students are starting off two years behind York Suburban, everywhere else. So when those kids are five and they're starting school, they're equal to our seven-year-olds. So we are behind before school ever starts. So before we mention the school in general, you need to remember we're already behind before school starts. My other thought would be police. I have a cousin who lives on East Prospect, right near Hennepin, and she calls me once a week. You know, I know we have put police on the streets, but all the times I've been to her house, I don't see them there and they need to be there. She's called me at 3 a.m., you know, what do I do? She's a single mom with two kids on the corner. She doesn't want to call the police. She's scared, so she calls me. She doesn't want to fear. She, she put up a six foot fence because she was afraid to let the kids in the yard. So, you know, we need to make sure that the police are there. I know they're at the library, but that's only getting to the kids that are at the library. We still have parents that still need to be re-educated on, they're here to help. They're not here to fight all of the parents as well as the kids. And trash, I, th I think, I know I appreciate our trash cleanup. Um, I do think though we have the same people picking up trash. We're not going around, yes we have certain homeowners, but what's the percentage of homeowners we actually have? So yes, there are some homeowners going out and cleaning up but we need to get more people involved. We've got kids that have been out on the weekends. They, 
they've been using to help clean up trash. We need to use more of that. Show the kids in the schools, use the schools as a resource to get the kids to help donate back. The kids love to clean up, clean up trash. So the more we teach them at school about the city, they're gonna grow to love the city in general. And that's it. Well, I'll make every effort to uh, make the alarm go off. <laughs> uh, again, thank you all for being here. It's good to uh, see so many familiar faces. Uh, the, the questions that's posed about increased taxes, devaluation of your home, um, crime, et cetera, et cetera. There, there are three fundamentals in my mind for York City Council. Safer, cleaner, and stable finances. Safer, we need to stay the course. Crime is down. Neighborhood policing is working. We need to stay the course. We need to continue funding it. And we need to have cleaner, a cleaner city. Cleaner, we need to have more PMIs. I know it's a tight budget, but honestly, I think that we would have return uh, far greater than the uh, few thousand dollars that we'd spend on uh, some uh, new PMIs, PMIs being uh, property maintenance inspectors. We need to tighten up the legislation, and I will certainly try to seek ways to introduce legislation that would tighten up the length of time that it takes whenever we can. Is there, are there possibilities of issuing citations instantly by the PMIs? What can we do to introduce legislation to tighten up and make the, uh, the penalties and then enforce them? Uh, we can't enforce them with only four people. It isn't possible. In my view, it isn't possible. So, and then we're looking at what are we gonna do to make this community financially stable? $18 million is raised by the taxes that you and I pay on our real estate, 18 million. $22 million is the cost of the police department. On top of that, another $10 million is the cost of the fire department. The entire budget is about 42 million, general fund budget. Now, is there any wonder that we're in trouble? 18 million and the police are 22. Think about it. I really hope that when one of these three gentlemen get go to the uh, state house that they are able to do what they're promising and I know that they'll work hard to try but in the meantime what are we going to do I want to look at the, the kind of pension systems that go on how many of you can retire at your work after 20 and a half years you'd be in your 40s how many of you that are retired get automatic colas, cost of living increases? How many of you can actually be working full time and collect a pension? Ladies and gentlemen, that is going on. Now, those are contracts, they're binding arbitration, but I do believe having talked to the police, having talked to firemen, that they are willing to talk with us. We just have to say, no, we're not doing this anymore. We can't afford it, this is not sustainable, and we're not going to do it, period. Thank you. I told you I'd have that thing go off. <laughs> Same question to Mr. Satterley. Thank you. Hi, David Satterley. I'm the newest member of city council. I'm usually the guy that takes the job nobody else wants. I'm running for the two-year seat. So when you're voting and you scroll all the way down through all those people, don't forget me at the bottom, okay? I would appreciate it. Um, 
I think at a, at a beginning level for myself in terms of how I think about the role of city council, it's this complicated issue of hearing all the voices of the people that live in the city. So we have some really loud voices at the city council meetings. We have a lot of people that I don't hear from at all. And we know that there's a variety of opinions going on in there. At the same time as I try to hear all these voices, the loud voices and the quiet voices, and I think even the people that don't speak to me in any way, I have to keep in mind what my own conscience is saying about the vote. I have to keep in mind what I think is the best answer to the vote. And I have to keep in mind what I think will work, what I think will pass, and what I think we can actually get done. All of those go into play. I try not to be someone who votes a particular way all the time. I try to be the one that thinks through all of those issues that we've been talking about and take into account all the voices I just mentioned. Um, I think the bottom line for us is home ownership. I think that when we talk about all these issues, that any way that we can to encourage people to buy homes in the city and stay in the city benefits all of us. Stable home ownership creates stable communities, creates investment in education, creates a belief in a neighborhood, and inspires other people to buy. We know that people want to leave because of the taxes, because of declining home value. The one thing I would say, and I said this at the other debate, I wanted you to be aware that your value of your home doesn't lower if you stay. It only affects you if you leave. And at a fundamental level, I want you all to stay in New York City. That if we stay, we survive and we work through these issues together. One of the questions asked was about a big initiative. I think it's time for bold activities, for some big ideas, for not activities made in fear of what could be, but activities made in the optimism of what is possible. I would say this, I'm not interested in waiting for Harrisburg. I believe in what the goodwill can be. I believe that there's possibilities there, but I'm not gonna wait for them to decide our fate. I think here, amongst the people that live in York City, we have to make our decisions for us now. And it can't be something that stalls. We can't just keep managing decline. We have to make some big decisions now. We don't know what all those might be, but we have to have a bigger conversation. We have to have more people coming to city council meetings. We have to have a bigger, input of ideas and thoughts to figure out what the next steps are. I hope you don't count on me sitting at the end of the row at city council meetings to figure all that out on my own. I'm interested in what you think about the idea of the Greater York Regional Authority. I think there's some great potential there and I'm hearing some good ideas about that. I want to have that conversation and together I believe that we can come up with the answers that are going to solve our problems and we can make a Great York City ourselves. Thank you. She's been figuring out my iPad pretty well tonight. We're moving on to the last question of the evening. And <laughs> thank you for your patience. We'll start with Ms. Nelson and loop back around. And we did set three. So to wrap up, why you and why now? Okay. Um, I'll throw out my buzzwords because everyone likes them. I would say that I am invested because I just bought another home a year ago for me and my daughters who I'm raising here in the city, most of all. Um, in addition to that, I'm consistent. Anyone who knows, I have voted against things whether I was in agreement with everyone else or not. I vote with my conscience and I vote with my gut and I sleep at night and I'm happy about that. Um, in addition to that, I have two grandmothers who are now on Duke Street because they couldn't afford the taxes in their home. So I will continue to vote and try and cut the budget even if it's $2 because I will continue to do that because every little bit helps. And we need to possibly do something for the seniors because they're losing their homes due to the taxes. You get to a point where your income, your social security isn't enough to pay for the taxes and that's not fair to work your whole life for a home. So I think that's why you should vote for me because I'm consistent. Who's that 
Mr. Nixon will be next. Why me? Why not? Uh, I'm not a professional politician. This is not uh, uh, part of my, uh, my resume building, being a, a servant of the city. I am passionate about the city. I love the city. I've chosen to live in this city for 43 years. I've raised my children in this city. They've gone to William Penn and the entire school system and graduated and they're fine kids. I want to be on council. I want to be part of the legislation that makes this place as much of a joy for me that it will be for my grandchildren who also live here in this city. Those are the reasons that I believe you should vote for me. I will have the guts to say no, I will have the guts to say yes when it's appropriate. And I believe that I have the kind of strategic thinking that can create regional partnerships that will reduce our costs significantly. I'm not looking for the $2,000. In fact, $100,000 isn't going to make a difference in a $42 million budget. It's going to take million dollars, millions of dollars. And we have to have the guts, and I'll need all of you to stand with me when we say, no, we're not doing this anymore. Thank you. I wish I was going last. I like going last. Um, I first became interested in York City Council because of the students I work with at Hack. Um, a lot of the students that go to the Hack York campus are city residents. They are people who grew up in York, grew up in this city, and are going to stay in this city. And they're trying to change their lives. And I was inspired by them. I believed in them. And I came to believe in York City. I love this town. Um, and I'm excited every day to be here. I never wake up on a weekend and think, I've got to get out of town. I wake up and think, I want to get into town. And I'm excited about that. Um, I've always been someone that solved problems. I've always been someone that was able to squeeze budgets where I've worked when I've needed. But I'll go back to the bigger idea, which I said is I've always been someone that was willing to go after the big idea and the bold move and take some risk to see some new things happen. I will do all those things. I will believe in the people that live here. I will love the city. I will make the small cuts that are valuable as we make adjustments, but I will go after the big moves. And I think going back to the final thing is that I will try to incorporate all the voices of the people, um, the ones that are in front of me and the ones that are in the back that maybe aren't speaking, take those things into account as we try to move forward to solve our problems. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm a nurse, and uh, I've learned to care about people, and I care about the citizens of York, and I'm hoping that you elect me as city council, um, and I will listen to you because you are the people that know best what works for York City. So vote for me, and we'll have a great York City. Thank you. I like to go last, too. <laughs> and I have the microphone. So, that, and but no timing. I'll self-regulate. I haven't thanked the audience yet, but now is time to do so. We had about 150 or 160 chairs here tonight, and at one point earlier on, I think almost all of them were filled, and we had standing room only. So thank you all.
the candidates know when they're going to set aside a time for an evening that they want to have good participation and that's what they got tonight and I'm very glad of that. I wish to thank all the candidates. Everybody showed up, everybody was, re uh, was prepared and had very thoughtful answers. And I know that it will all be for naught if you do not go to the polls on May 21st and actually cast your vote one way or the other. It's your choice, but go vote. There will be a chance now to mingle with the candidates, to have one-on-one -on -one time with them. I think that we'll migrate down towards the other end where there's the food and drink. But again, I thank Bukhart Horn for this venue. I thank the candidates and I thank you all. Have a great evening.